The continent of Australia has been isolated for over 96 million years. This isolation has caused the development of very unique creatures found nowhere else. Strange creatures live there today, but even stranger creatures inhabited the land down under long ago. One hundred million years ago, during the Cretaceous period, there existed a large continent now named Gondwana. This continent was made of South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, and other land masses. At this time, these lands were roamed by reptilian giants. Famous dinosaurs such as Spinosaurus, Gigantosaurus, and Argentinosaurus all inhabited this huge land mass. These dinosaurs would survive until 97 million years ago when their home began to split. Massive tectonic activity would tear Gondwana apart and send newly formed continents in every direction. This would cause Australia to drift into the endless horizon of the Pacific Ocean for millions of years. This isolation would cause Australia to be like no other. For the first 30 million years, Australia was ruled by dinosaurs. Lush Cretaceous forests would feed some of the largest dinosaurs to ever live. Gigantic sauropods like Savannosaurus and Diamantinosaurus would roam the land, foraging on the lush jungle landscape. A large Diamantinosaurus could weigh up to 20 tons. An animal of this size did not have to worry about predators, but a juvenile would most definitely fear Australia's largest theropod dinosaur. Australovnator was the largest theropod to inhabit Australia after it split from the mainland. It measured about 20 feet long and weighed an estimated 2,000 pounds. Although this monster mostly fed on Australia's smaller inhabitants, it most likely would be able to take down a juvenile Diamantinosaurus. The dinosaurs controlled much of the ecosystems on land, but small mammals would live in their shadow. By this time, two groups of mammals called the continent of Australia home. Early marsupial ancestors lived most likely like rats and would forage for food at night to avoid the reptilian hunters. As we all know, this animal would go on to evolve into iconic animals such as kangaroos, koalas, and other marsupials. The other animal species that calls Australia home are the monotremes. Monotremes are a type of mammal that actually lays eggs. A member of the monotremes that you may find familiar would be the platypus. In Cretaceous Australia, monotremes are very similar to modern day platypuses swam in the tropical bodies of water. Although these primitive platypuses were able to evade the clutches of the dinosaurs on land, they faced a completely different set of jaws in water. Prehistoric crocodiles and marine reptiles swam in the same water as these ancient monotremes. While the great battles between predator and prey waged on land, the same battles happened in the rich seas surrounding Australia. Many nautiloids, sharks, fish, and marine reptiles swam in these seas. Some notable creatures were the abundant marine reptiles. These animals were reptiles that took to the sea and adapted for ocean life. This group of animals were not fish though. Just like whales, they breathe air through their lungs and not through their gills. There were three main groups of marine reptiles living in these oceans. Although they were less common during this point in the Mesozoic, ichthyosaurs swam the oceans and filled a niche similar to modern day dolphins and fish. The next group were the long-necked plesiosaurs like Myosaurus and Tuarangosaurus. They used their paddle-like flippers and long necks to feed on unwary schools of fish. At this time, the undisputed king of the seas were the pleosaurs. These monsters had jaws over 10 feet long and a total body length of 45 feet. They fed on anything that they could get their massive jaws on. Lake Cretaceous Australia was an ecosystem full of reptilian beasts. These animals would flourish for Australia's first 30 million years until their untimely end. 66 million years ago, large sauropods were feeding on the jungle canopy in the early morning. Pterosaurs were soaring above, perhaps looking for small marsupials to prey upon. The predators were planning out their daily hunt as the sun rose. An ordinary Cretaceous morning was interrupted by a second sun flying across the sky. But this was no sun. This was an asteroid six miles wide coming on a crash course towards Earth. This meteor would not strike the land down under but instead it would strike the other side of the world in what is now Mexico. Although Australia was spared, the aftermath of the impact would affect the world for thousands of years to come. 
pulverized ocean floor all the way from Mexico would cover the sky and block out the sun. Temperatures on Earth would plummet, plants would not be able to photosynthesize, large herbivores would perhaps be the first ones to go because of a lack of food. The large predators would also die out due to nothing to eat. All of these poor conditions would cause all land animals over 55 pounds to die out. The animals in the water were not safe either. Acidic oceans and poor conditions would cause the ecosystem to collapse and no marine reptiles would survive excluding crocodilomorphs. Although this was not the worst mass extinction in history, it killed about 75% of all organisms on land and sea. This event did mark the extinction of all non-avian dinosaurs. That means the only dinosaurs to survive the KT mass extinction were small prehistoric birds. These birds look similar to modern day birds but were much different. They had teeth, long tails, and four wings. Though they had survived the KT mass extinction, they still had a tough journey ahead of them. This was the end of the Mesozoic era. An era of great reptilian monsters that lasted 186 million years. The aftermath of the meteor would usher in a new era. This era is called the Cenozoic. This roughly translates to new animal. The Cenozoic so far is divided into three periods. The first period of the Cenozoic was the Paleogene. Now that dinosaurs were gone, the smaller inhabitants of Australia could take over. For the next million years, the small survivors of the impact would have to try to survive the following nuclear winter caused by the meteor. The survivors included marsupials, monotremes, lizards, birds, and various other species. With a whole continent for the taking, mainly marsupials, reptiles, and birds would have to fight each other for the ecological niches. The ancient birds quickly took over the same role as modern day birds do. The marsupials became the main herbivores as well as predators, but the reptiles became the dominant predators on land. These reptiles were mainly snakes. Large species like your Lunger camphidensis would take advantage of the growing marsupial population and be the dominant land predator. Crocodiles were just as dominant as they were in the Cretaceous and patrolled the waterway for unwary animals. Already in the first millions of years, the emus had evolved. Emu Eris was the name of the early ancestor of the now famous birds. Other oddities fought for survival as well. Maolania was a large stem turtle that develops during the early Cenozoic. These new animals would continue the trend as the dinosaurs once did. Predators got better at hunting, and prey got better at surviving in the lush paleogene landscape. Since the only real predators at this time were large snakes, there was plenty of room for predators to evolve. The next period of the Cenozoic is called the Neogene, and it would be filled with extraordinary organisms. Giant flightless birds weighing over a thousand pounds roamed the lands like their dinosaur ancestors did millions of years before them. But thankfully, these birds were herbivores. Dromornis was one of these birds. It is estimated that it weighed over 1,500 pounds, making it one of the largest true birds ever to live. Marsupials began to really diversify at this time also. The first kangaroos hopped around and would diversify greatly. Other marsupials would occupy many ecological niches in the environment. Large herbivorous marsupials the size of cows roam the lands feeding on the lush vegetation. But no ecosystem is complete without its carnivores. The first groups of large carnivorous marsupials began to develop during this time. Two groups of carnivorous marsupials would start to develop in the late Neogene. One of these groups were the thylaconids, also known as the marsupial lions. The other group were the thylacinidids. They would begin to diversify and would later evolve into the thylacine better known as the Tasmanian Tiger. These groups would become very successful, but not into the Quaternary. The other animals that inhabited Australia at this time were massive snakes such as the Bluff Downs Giant Python. This particular species could grow up to a staggering 33 feet long. The famous Titanoboa is only 10 feet longer than the snake, which makes it one of the largest to ever slither across our planet. Meanwhile, in the seas of Neogene Australia, the first cetaceans arrived. Cetaceans are marine mammals. Common examples are whales and dolphins. Although these ancient whales were large, they are not large enough to escape predation. The most fearsome sea creature of all time swam these seas. Of course, I am talking about the infamous Megalodon. This predator weighed well over 100,000 pounds and possessed a deadly set of teeth. This great predator owned the seas the entire Neogene period, but ultimately went extinct during the end of it. Some paleontologists think it died out because of a lack of prey and increased competition, and others think it was due to climate change. Regardless, Megalodon would not make it past the end of the period. The Neogene period would transition into the next period because of a decrease in the Earth's temperature and widespread glaciation. 
The Quaternary Period is the most recent period on Earth and it began about 2.5 million years ago with the beginning of the last ice age. Although you may think 2.5 million years ago is relatively recent, Australia was a much different place than it is now. It was still a lush continent at the time and it allowed giant herbivores to roam the land. Ancient kangaroos called Procoptodons roamed the land. These ancient beasts weighed about three times as much as their modern day relatives weigh. Giant rhino-sized animals called Diprotodons grazed on the abundant grasses of the Australian outback. But not even their size of over 6,000 pounds was enough to save them from the monsters that lived among them. Thylacoleo was a marsupial predator that was a member of the Thylacoleonidae. This group of animals convergently evolved to look much like modern day lions, and that's where they got their nickname, the marsupial lion. Modern day lions have extra long canine teeth for killing their prey. The marsupial lion did not use its canines for killing, but instead it used its huge incisors to dig deep into an animal and then use its shearing molars to butcher its prey. Pound for pound, Thylacoleo has the strongest bite of any mammal species, living or extinct. Besides its impressive dental re, it also had claws on each of its limbs and it could use them for grappling and catching prey. These marsupial lions weighed about 300 pounds, which makes them about the size of a female lion. They were truly one of the most unique mammals to ever develop. An even scarier animal roamed these lands as well. Although dinosaurs have been extinct for millions of years, it didn't stop a member of the reptilian family tree from seizing control once again. Giant monitor lizards weighing over 1,300 pounds roamed the land. These overgrown monitor lizards most likely migrated from nearby islands and took over the spot of top predator on Australia. Megalania was not the only reptilian predator on Australia at the time. Quincana was a crocodilian that was adapted for land rather than water. It had long legs and sharp recurved teeth for killing its prey. Another reptile that was still around from the Paleogene was Meolania. This hardy turtle survived well into the Pleistocene and weighed about a thousand pounds. Despite all the predators, a very large flightless bird still existed. Jenny Ornus was taller than a man and weighed about 500 pounds. Although this ecosystem was very diverse and full of unique animals only native to Australia, it was a dying ecosystem. The Ice Age had taken its toll on the continent and it was starting to dry up. The ecosystem did not collapse over a decade, but it was a slow process lasting thousands of years. The final nail in the coffin for Australia's megafauna would be a bipedal ape that migrated all the way from Africa. Approximately 60,000 years ago, the first men set foot on the land down under. They had made the journey across a land bridge that had opened up due to falling seas. Although these creatures only weighed about 150 pounds on average, they were armed with deadly weapons with sharp stone tips. These humans are often referred to as aboriginals because they are the first humans to set foot on the continent. When these first men entered ancient Australia, many strange creatures inhabited it. These men most likely encountered creatures like Megalania, Thylacoleo, Quincana, Diprotodon, and other animals. We can only imagine the battles that these men had with the local wildlife. Luckily, the early settlers left behind a detailed account of what they saw in the cave walls. This illustration represents a group of aboriginals being attacked by what appears to be a mammal. There's no way of truly knowing what this animal was, but it was most likely a Thylacoleo. The reasoning behind my conclusion is because it looks to be a large marsupial with mammalian features such as rounded ears and spotted fur. The only two large mammalian predators on Australia at this time were the Thylacoleo and the Thylacine. Thylacines only weighed about 70 pounds and the animal depicted in this art is much bigger than the men. Here's another depiction of what is most likely an ancient marsupial lion. Unlike thylacine, this animal is depicted has large paws and stripes all the way up its back. Because of this, I strongly believe that this is a thylacoleo, but I might just be too optimistic after all. This next depiction is thought to be an extinct geniornis. This animal fits all the characteristics of the giant extinct bird, and fossil evidence backs this up. The next two examples are thought to be either the hunting of a giant short-faced kangaroo, or another type of living or extinct kangaroo. One of the most common animals featured in aboriginal art was the thylacine. A reason for this could be because thylacines could have held a significance to these early people. Perhaps the greatest hunter would distinguish himself by hunting the most thylacines. Regardless of what these people thought of this animal, the thylacine would go extinct on Australia's mainland about 2,000 years ago, and a population lived on Tasmania until the 1900s. Unfortunately, there is no depictions of the monstrous Megalania or Quincana in Aboriginal art, but there is mention of these beasts in Aboriginal stories. The name of the crocodilian beast Quincana is actually from one of these stories. Over the next thousands of years that humans lived on Australia, species after species would die out due to climate change and human activity. This event was called the Great Australian Megafaunal Collapse. This extinction can be blamed on many things, but the most obvious seems to be the arrival of humans. 
Homo sapiens are the deadliest predator on Earth. A small group of humans armed with razor-sharp spears can take down almost any animal. Predators like Megalania, Thylacoleo, and Quinconic cannot compete with the coordinated attack of a human. Eventually, all the large herbivores went extinct most likely due to human activity, and the outcompeted predators went with them. Although Australia's megafauna has gone extinct, the continent is still home to thousands of unique species found nowhere else on Earth. If there's one thing I want you to take away from this video, it is that life is somewhat fragile. Many species are in danger of extinction because of human activity or other reasons, and now that us humans are aware of the damage we can cause, we should make sure we don't lose any more animal species. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed learning about Australia's travel through time from dinosaurs to the arrival of man. This is the first large-scale project I have made on this channel, and I hope you liked it. If there's anything I got wrong in this video about Australia's history, just point it out in the comment section and make sure to stay productive about it. I'll try to make one of these longer videos every month or so about certain topics, so stay tuned for my future projects. I'll see you guys in the next episode of North O2. Also, I might change that name, so leave suggestions down below. See ya.